Okay, so uh, let us continue with our discussion of uh, analytic continuation. Okay. So, uh, I told you uh, last time that uh, there are uh, there are two notions of analytic continuation, one is the so called uh, direct analytic continuation and, uh, and this involves uh, this literally involves uh, gluing together two analytic functions on two domains which intersect okay and such that the analytic functions they <coughs> they give the same function on the intersection okay so direct analytic continuation uh, uh, means that you have you have uh, you have a diagram like this so this is uh, p1 comma f1 and you have this pair d2 comma f2 and we say d2 comma f2 <coughs> is a direct analytic continuation of d1 comma f1 or conversely if on this int on this intersection which is supposed to be non empty uh, uh, f1 and f2 coincide and uh, uh, so uh, the advantage of this is that you can define uh, 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 these two functions glue together to give a, an analytic function on the union okay so then uh, g from uh, d1 union d2 to c given by g restricted to di is equal to fi is analytic okay of course, uh, uh, the pair d1 union d2 comma g is certainly a direct analytic continuation of both of these. And of course, uh, the uh, further the direct analytic continuation is unique because of the identity theorem, which says that if two uh, analytic functions agree on a, uh, on an open non-empty open subset, uh, then they have to agree on the whole domain. Okay, so uh, so this is the story of direct analytic continuation, and we have all, we have of course seen that uh, uh, given uh, given a pair. Uh, d comma f there exists a unique maximal uh, extension ma maximal direct <coughs> analytic extension extension d1 comma f1 of d comma f so we have seen this uh, so the uh, uh, and we saw uh, uh, we saw two examples of this so the first example was d1 is the unit disk and f1 is the power series uh, corresponding to the geometric series okay uh, or rather let me call that as d and f <coughs> so you take the unit disk which is the disk of convergence of the power series given by the geometric series power series centered at 0 heat rate of convergence is 1 then then the maximal extension uh, d1 comma f1 is simply uh, the complex plane minus the point 1 and the function which is a maximal extension is 1 by 1 minus z you have seen this this is this was pretty easy to see because this power series represents the represents 1 by 1 minus z in the unit disk okay 
and that is def defined everywhere in the complex plane and analytic except at the point z equal to 1 where it has a simple pole right. The this was an easy example okay so uh, the other example is that of the Riemann zeta function uh, for which uh, uh, the domain you are going to consider is the right half plane uh, the open right half plane to the right of the line the vertical line passing through z equal to 1. So so in this case d is set of all z complex number z such that real part of z is greater than 1 and uh, the function uh, f is zeta where zeta of z is the Riemann zeta function uh, which is sigma n equal to 1 to infinity 1 by n power z and uh, this is defined as uh, uh, sigma n equal to 1 to infinity 1 by e power z ln n where ln n is the usual real logarithm uh, so uh, so the fact is uh, of course uh, uh, there is some work involved in checking that zeta itself is an analytic function okay so that involves the use of v m strass m, m test which we did last time uh, and of course we also use need to use the fact we need to use the Weierstrass m test to check that uh, zeta uh, uh, the this the series converges to a function uh, normally okay uh, in this domain which means it is the convergence is uniform on compact subsets okay and then uh, further uh, since we have already seen in an earlier lecture that whenever you have a sequence of analytic functions which converges normally to a limit function and the limit function is also analytic by using that fact uh, 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 whose proof essentially uses Morera's theorem uh, we can check that zeta is actually analytic is an analytic function on this uh, on this on this right half plane uh, it is a non trivial theorem to show that the maximal analytic extension of zeta is defined on uh, just like the geometric series it is defined on the whole complex plane minus 1 and uh, uh, at 1 you get a pole of order 1 simple pole okay uh, so uh, uh, it is uh, non trivial to show that the maximal extension extension of zeta is defined on complex plane minus the, uh, the point z equal to 1 with a simple pole at z equal to 1 okay. So uh, we will see if we will see the proof of this later but then this tells these two examples tell you uh, they give you the uh, the, the, the degree of difference in the degree of difficulty okay here is an example in which the maximal analytic extension is very easy to understand and here is one in which it is very difficult uh, it is not it is not directly easy to check that you have a maximal analytic extension okay. Uh, I mean uh, what I mean is it is not easy to check what the maximal domain on which the function extends this and uh, uh, what the corresponding function is okay one has to do lot of analysis to check that just like in this case the only point where this ha this uh, zeta function does not extend is z equal to 1 where of course it becomes a harmonic series uh, and uh, um, you know uh, and to do that one has to do a lot of analysis. So, uh, so this is the problem of direct analytic continuation now uh, what we do next is go to this notion of indirect analytic continuation and uh, so what is this indirect analytic continuation so the word indirect is something that I am stressing usually in the literature the word that is used is just analytic continuation and I am stressing the word indirect because uh, I want you to distinguish between these two. So this indirect analytic continuation is something it is nothing but a chain of uh, or a sequence of direct analytic continuations successively okay. So you know so uh, it is a chain 
of direct analytic continuations. Of course, I uh, instead of the word uh, analytic continuation, I also use the word analytic extension. Okay, in the previous lecture, so that is also often used. So we instead of saying direct analytic continuation, we also say direct analytic extension. And the indirect analytic continuation. Instead of that, you can also say, use the word indirect analytic extension. Okay. Uh, so what is a uh, what is an indirect analytic continuation? It's a chain of direct analytic continuation. So you know it's it's something like this. So you have uh, you have a sequence of domains. Of course, uh, in the diagrams that I am drawing, uh, I, I am showing bounded domains. Okay, but they need not be bounded. Okay. So you know you have uh, d1 so you have uh, d alpha 1 comma f alpha 1 so you know I used uh, 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 so so let me write it like this d alpha 1 f alpha 1 uh, is the first pair which consists of an analytic function f alpha 1 on this domain which is d alpha 1 and that going that has a direct analytic continuation to d alpha 2 f alpha 2 which is which is defined here and then that further has a direct analytic continuation to d alpha 3 f alpha 3 and so on and finally I end up with d alpha n f sub alpha n okay. So uh, the point about this is that every uh, uh, every successive pair is a direct analytic continuation of the previous pair okay and uh, the point is that uh, every successive pair is a direct uh, analytic continuation of the previous and the next okay but there is no relationship between one pair and another pair which is not uh, its predecessor or successor okay. So you know d alpha, d alpha 1 f alpha 1 if I try to look at d alpha 1 f alpha 1 and d alpha 3 f alpha 3. Uh, there is d alpha 3 f alpha 3 need not be a direct analytic continuation of d alpha 1 f alpha 1 because to begin with they may not even intersect as I have drawn it in the picture okay. Of course the fact is that uh, if they intersect and if the intersection uh, is uh, has some uh, intersection common with the uh, second pair then of course they will all grow up to give a single uh, analytic uh, function and d alpha 3 f alpha 3 will become a direct analytic continuation of d alpha 1 f alpha 1 okay. But the problem is that first of all these two need not intersect the second problem is even if they intersect the intersection need not have anything in common with their intersections with uh, uh, with the intersection of these two and the intersection of these two okay. So you know you, you could have something like this you could have something like this you could have a situation like this. Okay, so here is d alpha one, f alpha one, and here that is here, and that has a direct analytic continuation d alpha two, f alpha two, and then you can have direct analytic continuation, continuation d alpha three, f alpha three, and this is a direct analytic continuation of this, which means alpha f alpha one and f alpha two coincide here. This is a direct analytic continuation of this, that means f alpha two and f alpha three coincide here, and this is a direct analytic continuation. Uh, well I mean uh, this need not be a direct analytic continuation of that this these two need not be be direct analytic continuations continuations okay such a thing can happen such a thing can happen. So uh, you start with the function you go back you you probably come back to the uh, uh, you come back to uh, you analytically continue it once then you again uh, further analytically continue it and then end up with a function which has uh, uh, which on the uh, which has some region in common with the, the starting domain but the function may be different f alpha 3 and f alpha 1 need not coincide on this intersection okay. So so the question is this is a this is a strange thing that happens so what is actually happening is the following what is actually happening is that uh, if you have chain of uh, so in this case 
you are having a chain of uh, direct analytic continuations. So, you have an indirect analytic continuation d alpha 3 f alpha 3 is an indirect analytic continuation of d alpha 1 f alpha 1. Then the question is of course, what is how is f alpha 3 related to f alpha 1 that is our question ok. I told you f alpha 3 and f alpha 1 need not uh, uh, agree on this intersection ok. So, more generally the question is I have d alpha 1 f alpha 1 I start with a particular pair here and then I do an indirect analytic continuation and I finally end up with uh, uh, a final pair d alpha n f alpha n. My question is how is f alpha n n related to f alpha 1 that is the question ok. How is it related? So, uh, the fact is that the answer to that is the following the answer to that is well uh, this and this are not totally unrelated they are branches of a multi valued analytic function ok. So, like for example, uh, this could be a logarithm a branch of the logarithm, but then this could be some other branch of the logarithm ok. So, uh, for example, in this case uh, you know this could be a branch of the logarithm and then when I come back this f alpha 3 could be a different branch of the logarithm ok this can happen. Uh, if you think of the Riemann surface for log z this is what is happening as you move along the sheets you move from one branch to the next branch and if you take its image on the complex plane you will see that as you go around once your branch of the the starting uh, branch of the logarithm af after you go around once the or once around the origin the new branch that you get the new function you get which is an indirect analytic continuation of the old branch the first one that you started with is a new branch of the logarithm. So, the reason why we study indirect analytic continuation is that it allows you to move from one branch of a function to another branch of a function ok that is the importance of studying this. So, uh, so uh, well I, I told you that uh, there is one way of uh, uh, looking at this uh, uh, a way of formulating this uh, and that is uh, uh, in fact there are uh, two ways of formulating indirect analytic continuation one is this as a chain the other one is to use power series ok. So, that is what we were trying to look at last class. So, uh, uh, power series power series uh, formulation of indirect analytic continuation So, what is this power series formulation it is a uh, it is it is done like this. So, basically the idea is that you know uh, you have uh, you start with a point z naught you go along a path to a point z 1. So, this path is gamma all right. So, gamma uh, 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 so gamma is a path you have a closed interval a b on the real line which if you want you can take it as the unit interval 0 1 ok and you have a continuous function from this to the complex numbers ok. The image of gamma is a path uh, with z naught equal to gamma of uh, gamma of uh, a and z 1 is equal to gamma of b this is the starting point this is the ending point this is the path alright and the idea is that you know. Uh, if you give me a general point here it is given by gamma of t where t is a point in the interval real interval a comma b ok. And what we want is that at this point you know we want to uh, look at a function which is analytic at this point and given by a power series ok. So, uh, so what is happening is that you are looking at uh, 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 for for each t uh, 1 is given uh, an analytic uh, uh, a power series uh, f t of z which is given by uh, so sigma 
a n equal to 0 to infinity uh, uh, a n of t z minus uh, gamma of t to the power of n with radius of convergence uh, or uh, with radius of convergence uh, uh, r of t and disk of convergence uh, mod z minus gamma t is less than r of t. So, so I have uh, so for each t I am given a power series uh, uh, of course uh, the so I am giving for each t I am giving you a power series for each t I am giving you a power series and the power series so I have to put an f sub t of z this is a power series centered at gamma of t so it is an expansion in terms of uh, z minus gamma t all right with some coefficients and the coefficients also depend on t all right uh, well if you put t equal to t naught that means you are choosing a point in this interval so its image will be a particular point here and then f f t naught of z will be a particular power series okay and uh, uh, the the assumption is that the radius of convergence is r of t is positive okay uh, and the disk of convergence is uh, 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 is given of course by uh, the disc centered at the center of the power series and radius equal to radius of the uh, convergence of the power series okay and of course you know in all these situations you must remember that we are really not interested in the case when the radius of convergence is infinite okay we are only re interested in the case when the radius of in convergence is finite because if the radius of convergence is infinite it means it is an entire function okay it means the maximal uh, extension is on the whole complex plane and it, it uh, the given function is actually a restriction of an entire function and there is nothing to there is nothing complicated happening there okay you are just your function is just a restriction of an entire function. So that is not the situation we are interested in that is a very trivial situation okay we are interested in functions which have which have finite uh, disks of convergence namely whose radii of convergence are finite and why are such functions important they are important because on the border on the on the circle of convergence there are singularities okay. Uh, so uh, if a if a function uh, represented by a power series you take a power series uh, uh, if you if it has a finite radius of convergence then on the circle of convergence there is at least one point which is a singular point for the function because if no point was a singular point of the function then I can extend the function to an analytic function to a disc larger which contains this circle of convergence and that contradicts the very definition of circle of convergence okay. So why we are interested in uh, functions with you know finite radii of convergence is for this reason because it gives you all the functions uh, which have singularities okay which you can study right. So, uh, so the situation is that I am so for every point uh, I am give I am giving you uh, a power series okay and uh, we would like this power series uh, we would like the power series to vary continuously with respect to t okay that is uh, uh, just like uh, uh, gamma is a continuous function of t okay which means that this is a continuous path alright. We would also like f t to vary continuously with respect to t and one way of uh, 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 stating that is that you know if what we can what you can say is that if you take uh, uh, t prime close to t on the interval you can require that gamma uh, this uh, this this power series f t and f t prime they are one and they represent the same analytic function on the intersection of the uh, two disks okay. So which means that you are uh, if for t prime close to t you are assuming that f t prime is a direct analytic continuation of f t okay. So you know so the, the additional uh, condition that you are going to put is the following uh, if you take uh, so suppose this is gamma t prime. Uh, which is close to gamma t this ra this radius of convergence is r t if I take if I do it for gamma t prime I will get I will get another uh, disc here and uh, it will have radius of convergence r t prime okay and what I am uh, requiring is that for t prime close to t 
if t prime is close to t then gamma t prime is close to gamma t because gamma is continuous okay and I am requiring that uh, on this disc f t is defined and on this disc f sub t prime is defined and what I want is that I want that f t and f t prime are direct analytic continuations of each other in, in this common region that is f t should be the same as f t prime in this uh, intersection okay. So further for t close to t prime which should be thought of as t prime belonging to an epsilon neighborhood of t in the in the on the real line that is that is for t prime belonging to t minus epsilon t plus epsilon intersection ab this is what it means okay t prime in an epsilon neighborhood of t uh, epsilon for some epsilon su sufficiently small small and positive okay that is what uh, uh, t prime close to t means or t close to t prime means okay uh, we must have so let me continue here we require that f t f t prime is a direct analytic continuation continuation of f t okay. So this is the condition so this is the condition that you uh, say that you know uh, uh, so so what is happening is that as t moves from a to b the point gamma t starts from z0 and ends with z1 and as you move close so at every point you are giving me a power series okay and if you take nearby points the analytic functions represented by the power series are one and the same on the intersections okay. So what you are giving me is analytic functions which are uh, you are giving me a uh, sequence of analytic functions that are moving along this path and uh, in such a way that locally they are they represent the same analytic function okay. So uh, um, we, we, we say we say that uh, uh, so the, the point I want to make is that uh, well if we formulate it like this if you formulate it like this then you know uh, the uh, if you take f sub a which is the analytic function uh, at uh, z0 which is gamma of a uh, that uh, if you look at that and if you look at f sub b which is the analytic function at gamma b uh, gamma of b which is z1 I claim that they are uh, indirect analytic continuations of each other okay. So then f then uh, 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 this pair which consists of mod z minus z z not less than r of a z not is mind you gamma of a uh, comma f a of uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the the initial one and the final one z minus z one less than r b z1 is z1 is the same as gamma b and f b are indirect analytic condition continuations continuations of one another they are indirect analytic continuations of each other okay with the uh, in the sense of the earlier definition so I am just saying that the new definition I am just trying to prove that this new definition which involves a continuously varying power series uh, that uh, that is the same as this original definition I am trying to say they are the same uh, and in, in so by saying that I am trying to say that this is a, a more uh, you know. Uh, stricter formulation of this uh, which involves an analytic expression 